Hey, everybody. It's such an honor to be here. So I, I just want to start by thanking Jamie and the Museum of New Mexico Foundation for this nice invitation. And the staff, uh, Laura and Steve Cantrell, who did so much to get all the details together, uh, the Design Council for dreaming this up, and Design Corps for pushing it. And thank you. It's really something. It's always an honor to be in this building, I think. Um, it's like a pilgrimage site for me. Every time I come here, I look at the Gerard Wing, and I find in it such a genre-bending, definition-blurring, joyous celebration of how people are creative, of how they encode their lives in their art, and how they bring that to their children and the future generations. So I'm always here looking and absorbing and taking inspiration. So it's great to be here. Now, the hardest thing I have to do is bring my slideshow up. Let's see how it goes. Oh my God. The... Thank you, Paul. He's up there somewhere. This is great. So the books that Jamie mentioned just arrived this afternoon. It's the first, this is the first lecture. This is the first time anybody's buying the book. This is the first time I'm giving this talk. So forgive me any ruts or creaks in the process, but we're gonna do our best, right? So because this is the design council, I wanted to do something about color and communication. So this, this lecture is about color at work, storytelling and branding, packaging, and commercial imagery. I'm blending in here a good bit of things from Deep Color too, which takes a spin as far back as the Big Bang. I do skip a few things in the many billions of years along the way to get to the present, but um, this is a little bit different in the presentation. So one of the things that we talk about at Pantone uh, in terms of the power of color is that 93% of purchases are made based on visual information. This one of our five senses is our leader generally in how we're perceiving the world and how we're organizing that world. And color is a huge portion of that mechanism. 85% of the decision to purchase something is driven by color alone. That means color is an incredibly powerful tool. How does that come about? Well, color is, has a, at least a 300,000 year history of human usage, at least, probably 500,000. And it starts with red ochre. There are archeological finds in human settlements that show that red ochre is being used. We don't really know what for, we can hypothesize, but somehow this color of our life's blood was important to us incredibly early on. There's evidence based uh, in the strata of a cave in the Republic of Georgia, where scientists were looking at pollen samples to see what was growing. There's evidence of twisted flax fibers, twisted bast fibers, that are very clearly colored, light blue, pink, green, yellow, and gray. What were they using this dyed fiber for? We don't know. Why were the different colors important? And they, they would have to be important to make them. They don't happen by accident, right? The alchemy of the dye pot doesn't happen by accident. So what kind of classifying was happening with these colors? What kind of beauty was being made with these colors? We don't know. The earliest example of indigo, my favorite, was 6,200 years ago from Peru, with the arid climate allows for greater, uh, more frequent preservation of textiles. And indigo is still with us, of course, today. It's one of the few natural dyes still present in commercial uh, application. So these things could invite us to think of color as the most ancient mind-altering drug. And there's plenty of great thinking about this. Matisse says the same, Kandinsky clearly says the same, Gauguin says the same. Color reaches so deep into us and so quickly with so many strands of meaning. Why? I think it starts with nature. We allow ourselves to be swept up in natural beauty. It takes us somewhere and we can't help but translate that into the things that we create. So this is an ancient Egyptian fresco of the sky. This is an ancient Roman fresco of the immersive green of a beautiful garden. And we can come right up to today with the light installations of Terrell and other artists, which just pull us in to their depth. So compelling. Meow Wolf, right, in a slightly more psychedelic context, reaches into us a lot through color and noise and other things too. But all of this, I think, has underpinnings in folk art. 
When we start to think about color, we have to think about the skill that it took to draw yellows from kutch, from weld, from turmeric, from the flavonoid yellows that exist in most leafy plants that chlorophyll hides until chlorophyll goes away in the dye pot and the flavonoid chemistry comes forward to take root in fiber. We also have matter root, at least in usage for 4,000 years, probably longer. Uh, and that brings out these beautiful tawny oranges. And uh, its color chemistry is so fascinating. It has alizarin, it has purpurin, pseudopurpurin, mengistin, which allows it to achieve an entire range of warm colors from red to orange to purple to brown. And green, one of my favorites, right? The color of peace and, and life and growth. And that little piece of sky, right? Turquoise. Uh, the, the one on the right is a local image, right? That's a bunch of beautiful peyote bird jewelry that I took a photograph of in my garage. Pretty great. And, the, and on the left are uh, ceramics from Uzbekistan, right? And the notion that we could capture this feeling of limitlessness in the color turquoise is fabulous. And indigo, as I said, my favorite. The alchemy of the indigo plant is so profound, I think it's part of what makes us so fascinated by the magic of color. Moving from a green plant, which disintegrates into a disgusting yellow dye vat, which then transforms through oxida oxidation into the blue of indigo, it's magic. And let's not forget purple. That great symbol of eccentricity and royalty and rarity starts off, in most cases, with a crummy little shellfish, right? Whose mucousy secretion, uh, again, oxidizes and forms purple on fiber. There's also another way to get purple, but we'll talk about that in a little while. And then you have all the deep colors, the charcoals, the dark woods, the sensuous, luscious darks uh, that also intrigue us. But let's talk about red. Red, beautiful color of feminine power. You see Guatemalan textile on the left and Uzbek textiles on the right. And red comes from so many things. Lack, uh, matter, as we said, cochineal, many beautiful ways of reaching beautiful red colors. So anything we talk about now in terms of applying this in a commercial context has really deep cultural roots that come from folk art. Okay, in a discussion of color in a commercial context, I think it's really important to acknowledge that every color has a positive pole of meaning and a negative pole of meaning. No color means everything, but they do run from positive to negative. So let's talk about red. It's blood, it's the color of life, it's womanhood, it's love, passion, beauty, romance, it's sex, it's vanity, it's scandal, lust, adultery, guilt, right? Red radiates with all of this energy. It goes into power, manhood, authority, victory, faith, murder. And then we get to politics. <laughs> Let's just skip that. So. <laughs> <laughs> we mentioned red ochre as being the most ancient pigment we have evidence of, and it occurs all over the world. There are red ochre cave paintings in every continent except Antarctica, maybe there too, but we just don't know yet. When we look at figurines from the Neolithic period, like this woman of Willendorf, which was covered in red ochre, we immediately start to make a connection to fertility, right, to the power of giving life. And that seems quite undeniable. And that comes to us in an unbroken line. When you see um, iconography and signage that has to do with pregnancy, it's almost always in red. When Pantone developed this color called Period Red a few years ago with a Swedish company, it was an attempt to bring discussion of this out into the public so that we could speak about it frankly, scientifically, properly, as opposed to being hampered by taboos. And it has shown some signs of helping a few people do that. I put the red eggs in there because this is an ancient fertility symbol that survives to this day in Orthodox culture, in Chinese culture. And look, red is a beauty color. How profound is that? On the left, we have Dorian Lee, the world's first supermodel in a 1950s Revlon campaign called Fire and Ice. And on the right, we have Naomi Campbell in a much more recent image. The draw of red is undeniable. And there are um, studies that have been done that show that red, statistically speaking, does provoke much more interest from men. Women wearing red clothing and red lipstick were 35% more likely to attract attention when seated alone in a bar. <clears throat> 
just in case it matters to you. <laughs> Qualitative studies have been done that show that red does make women seem more attractive and more available. However, when men wear red, it may make us seem more authoritative and thus perhaps more wealthy and thus perhaps better mates, but it does not make us seem more attractive or more likable. <laughs> so red as a fashion color, it continues to be incredibly powerful, right? There's just no denying it. It hits the runways on the most regular basis. I'm happy that there's a whisper of the hot pink that we've been seeing a lot of because we're gonna get to that a little bit later. So, red in packaging, sensuality, telegraphs it immediately. But red has a lot of sacred connotations too. This is a picture of a performative ritual called Theam, which is conducted in the Indian provinces of Kerala and Karnataka. In this process, there is a little uh, animal sacrifice in the beginning, and the magic of blood helps low caste performers become uh, the personification of the highest of the gods. So the magic of red to transport someone to a higher place is based on blood. We're no strangers to blood magic in this culture. This is uh, an image of the Holy Grail. The notion that the blood of someone could transform us to be something else is intrinsic, right, to red, the power of transformation. Of course, this power of transformation became very power-focused as opposed to transformation-focused. And red is a color of power in the church is something that we know a lot about. And you've probably most of you seen the Cochineal exhibit that was here a few years ago. And the link between red, luxury, and power is completely undeniable. This gives us monarchy. This is, of course, Napoleon in the middle, who created an empire out of whole cloth and needed all the symbols of royalty to affirm the status that he grasped. You see other images of European monarchs to this day embracing the same. On the left is a um, traditional Nigerian monarch, and they don't have legal power, but they're very respected socially, and people come to them for guidance. And on the right, you see power wielded in a very different way to uh, overthrow all of those things as a tool of communism, right? as a symbol of communism. So that brings us to war. Red is the color of war. This is an image of Mars painted by Rubens. This is a Chinese opera mask of a god of war, and you see this coming to us in the most contemporary contexts. That's uh, Hemsworth as Thor with the obligatory red because he's the god of war. And on the lower, that's an image from a video game. Right? The notion of red, leadership, blood, violence comes to us unbroken from ancient times. Okay, we're back. <laughs> this is the red power tie. I'm sure we all have something to say about that. I wanted to tell you that red as a color of political leaders stretches far back beyond the slides we just looked at to Charlemagne. Charlemagne was, was crowned Holy Roman Emperor head to toe in red, boots to cape. And the reason for that is that he was seeking to be equal to, in power to the Pope. And the Pope's color was red. And after Charlemagne claimed that for secular power, the Pope had to switch to white because there had to be a distinction between the divine power and the earthly power. But we can thank Charlemagne on some level for the red power tie. We can also thank Charlemagne for these. It concerns me that red has been abused this way um, because the innate human warmth of red is what red should be all about the fire, right? The attraction, the passion, the positivity of red. And red does get used that way still. Red is a call to action to do something urgent and decent is still in the air. Companies who use red in their logos are seeking this call to action. They want you to notice them. They want you to find them. They want you to continue to find them. They want to hold your attention. They want to be an authority. So when we see red used in commercial contexts, it's worth a second thought, isn't it? To see whether or not you want to give that authority to them with any consistency. Red carries itself around the world with these kind of messages in a commercial context. Pink. A lot of, I got a little guff from having pink have its own chapter because people said, what about turquoise? What about celadon? What about lavender? I like all of those. And it's true, they're very nice. But pink <laughs> has played a role a social role uh, that really merits it a particular discussion. So let's talk about that. So femininity, prettiness, softness, gentleness, frivolity, youth, freshness, 
gayness, protest, action, self-defense, right? So we see something moving from gentle and frivolous to something quite vehement. So let's talk about that. Pink doesn't enter Western languages until the 17th century, 16th century. And it only then picks up any momentum as something that means something. It was just a function of red until that point. It takes off in the Rococo era. So the person you see here on the left is Madame de Pompadour, who was frequently um, painted wearing pink clothing. It was popular, it was trendy, it was in fashion, but it also served another purpose. It kept her out of the way of the royals, the queen, the princesses, the, the king's daughters. It kept her off to the side in her own category. And she used that power to discern between how not to get in trouble and how to get in trouble. She was the only mistress that ever permitted to die at Versailles. Even after the king stopped going to her bedroom, she was a trusted advisor. She really achieved something here. And pink was one of the ways that she communicated how different she was from other women in the court. On the right, I just put that in there because, wow, how's that? <laughs> and <laughs> But also to point out that pink was not a gendered color until World War II. World War II hits and pink is used in a really, maybe not so great way to soften the return of women from independent working status back into the home. And it took off so vehemently that by the time you hit 1957, you have the Fred Astaire, Audrey Hepburn movie called uh, Funny Face. And you have this production number, Kay Thompson, singing Think Pink. I would recommend that tonight, before you go to bed, you go home and YouTube it, because the lyrics are pretty darn good. It's really good. But it was a major phenomenon, right? This idea of femininity, this idea of redefining women's place back into the home, back into submissiveness, was a thing. Now, did this pink stove make cooking any more fun? That was the thought. That was the thought. I'm sure she could overboil her vegetables just as well on a white stove. Pink is still used to soften, to disarm, to seduce uh, in many kinds of packaging. And in Millennial Pink, I'm sure you're all familiar with Millennial Pink, it's often been said that Millennial Pink just put us back on our heels and lulled our critical sensibilities. Pink is used that way. In brighter tones, it's used to sort of pep things up. It's a little frivolous in these contexts, right? It's fun. It, doesn't want you to take it very seriously. But along comes another strand of pink. In the 80s, in the peak of the AIDS crisis, a graphic designer named Avram Finkelstein reappropriates the Nazi symbol for gayness, the triangle, turns it right side up, and puts it in a punk graphic color. Very appropriate for the 80s, right, when that whole punk thing was happening. This was the first time anybody demanded that AIDS be talked about in a public manner. So pink starts to take on a different sensibility in this reappropriation. A few years later, 1991-92, the pink ribbon as a symbol of uh, breast cancer research and breast cancer care starts to come out, and pink starts to achieve a real purpose, and not just in Western societies. This is a photograph of the Gulabi Gang, a group of 400,000 Indian women who wear hot pink saris as their uniform and demand proper treatment of women. So if they catch someone abusing their wives or their daughters, uh, they appear and shame him publicly in the marketplace. And if he doesn't listen and the abuse continues, they show up with these bamboo sticks. And they beat him. And there's some very eloquent quotes from the leader, who is the woman here towards the lower left, looking very stern and forceful about exactly how willing she is to provide that beating. <laughs> and think about the peak of protest pink. This is something that I wrote about for Pantone in 2011, that pink as a, as a color of purpose was, was rising upon us. So 2017, women demanding not to be forgotten, people demanding to be seen and noticed. I love pink as a protest color because it is not red. It is not a color of regime change. It's a color of thought change. It's not swapping a king for a, for a dictator. It's demanding a change in thought. It's fantastic. So why do we have all this hot pink out there now in fashion? I think it's because pink is not red, and yet pink is a color of purpose. I think it's because in the advent of social media, people want to be seen. They want to feel that they matter. And dressing in things like this, obviously, puts you front and center, makes you incredibly visible. 
And again, pink is losing its status as a gendered color. It's definitely making its way into menswear as well. The Barbie movie. I have to say, there was a period of two weeks when quite a number of journalists reached out to me for a comment on this, the few stills that were released with the Barbie movie, which comes out next year. So we haven't even seen the movie yet. And I noticed how many times people leaned into negativity about this just based on the pink. And I think it comes from a strand of misogyny. I think we still think of pink as a gendered color. We still think of it as frivolous and meaningless. And yet, we haven't seen the movie. So, so many other things are happening with pink, and yet we still want to think of it in the negative. Who knows? Maybe this movie will chart out something meaningful. I don't know. All right, moving on to orange. We're going to pick up the pace because I can't keep you here forever. So <laughs> orange comes into Western language at roughly the same time as pink. And interestingly, orange has not gotten very complicated. It's still very sweet. It has more to do with fragrance. Etymologically, it comes from a word for fragrance, naru. Uh, so holiness, because of Theravada Buddhism and the use of saffron robes. It's glowing. It's sensual. It's a little bold with safety orange. It can serve as a warning. We can go into psychedelics. But none of these things are necessarily negative. It's just really based on the beauty and the fragrance of the orange. It creeps its way into fashion. Look how perky. Look how uncomplicated. Look how fresh. You have no negative reaction to these things. And look how orange gets used in logos and in character development. It's happy. Think of Tigger. Orange is roughly the Tigger of the spectrum. It's beautiful. Orange did get a little flirtation with psychedelia, right? Orange sunshine was said to be the purest LSD. Anybody want to raise their hands and confess? OK. <laughs> Excellent. So Jimi Hendrix was a fan. And a lot of his poster, a lot of his concert graphics turned out to be heavy with the orange. Safety orange. It's one of the few colors defined in our federal code. It's in the laws of 39 out of 50 states about when it needs to be used, mostly in hunting, but in other circumstances as well. And that has had a really interesting effect on fashion. Right? For a while, orange was the color for prison uniforms. And when orange starts to gain popularity through fashion and through the television show Orange is the New Black, most prisons actually had to change away from orange because it wasn't distinct enough anymore from civilian attire. Yellow. Now, on the positive side, Yellow, of course, has sunshine, warmth, happiness, optimism. In some cultures, it stands for luck and wealth, which can be easily translated to excess. On the negative side, yellow has been a symbol of apostasy and outsiderness and treachery and discord. And returning a little bit more to the 20th century, it can be seen as a color of the avant-garde. It can be seen as something merely bright and attention-catching. We're not going to talk too much about the negative part. That's, I think, for another, another historical discussion. Let's talk about the positive parts. It's mostly drawn from the sun. Sunshine is indeed a little bit yellow, even though the, sun, sun, the light that comes from the sun is white. It's because some of the blue wavelengths of light scatter across the atmosphere, which is why we have blue skies. And it does subtly tint sunlight to be warmer and more yellow by the time it reaches us. And yellow in nature is amazing, right? It's one of the most common colors in nature. This is an artist named Wolfgang Leib, who did a huge installation at MoMA a few years ago. That's uh, hazelnut pollen. So I'm sure it was beautiful, and I'm sure it was also irritating for some of us. <laughs> and yellow is a natural dye. We mentioned it a little bit earlier, right? The, the turmerics, the flavonoid chemistry of many dye plants, um, other sources of yellow create something that's so radiant and so happy. We see this natural idea of yellow coming into packaging and product development in a really happy way, mostly mellowed down to kind of a honey value. It seems sincere, right? It seems lovely, non-controversial, healthy, which is a little different from how yellow was used in the 20th century in, the, in terms of graphics and, and uh, logos and product development. In the 20th century, the Bauhaus defined yellow as the most visible color and brands that wanted to telegraph convenience and universal access used yellow in a really important way. But at a certain point, that really seemed to fall out of favor because in, a, in an urban context with too many yellow brands competing for your attention, how could yellow be the most visible color, right? Too much cacophony, too much crowding. 
Yellow as a source of happiness. Let's talk about the smiley face. This is a graphic designer named Harvey Ball. And Harvey Ball was approached by an insurance company that was in the middle of a merger. One company had bought the other. And they had a morale problem. So they approached Harvey, and Harvey drew the first smiley face in about seven minutes. He got about $40, I believe. And the rest is history. It swept the world. So by the time you hit the 70s, about 10 years later, copyright infringement, he did not hold the copyright, nor did the insurance company. Others reached out to own the symbol. So there was a copyright held here in the US and a copyright held in Europe. It made other people hundreds of millions of dollars. All those buttons and, and patches that you all sewed on your denim jackets made somebody rich. But the smiley face is the root of the uh, emoji that we use on our phones today. One of the copyright holders worked with a Japanese cell phone company named SoftBank to develop the first emoji interface in 1994. And you know how often we use those now, right? Billions of times a day this comes to us. So yellow in current logo usage. Through places like McDonald's and DHL, we still see brands wanting to be perceived as universally accessible and convenient and immediate, right? You also see a little bit of luxury, I think, coming in there, the luxury of information, the luxury of authority coming in here a little bit. And just going back to the taxi cab yellow, I think you still see it in radiant brights and fun. Let's go to green. So green is one of my favorites. It stands for growth, life. It's grassy, it's plenty, it's positive, it's pastoral and soothing. It can also be tricky, right? With the rise of camouflage as a fashion choice, what does that say in terms of wanting to be crafty and hidden? And I think that links to a certain amount of wildness, wicked and poison, right? Think of the Wicked Witch of the West. There were no green witches until the Wicked Witch of the West, believe it or not. That was an invention of, technicolor, of a technicolor makeup artist working on that movie. And of course, these days, we know very clearly that green is a symbol of preservation and ecological responsibility, right? It's the color of a healthy planet. And it's used very clearly to show that this is what we should be driving for, right? It's an immensely positive force. It's the food that nourishes us. We, of course, feel good about it. And when used in a product context, all that soothing, relaxed, I'm in the presence of goodness feeling can come Right? Even when you shift values to a little bit more yellow. Or when you stay closer to plant-based green. Right? And I think you see brands using this in order to seem stable, to seem healthy, to seem dependable, and maybe to give you a little access to the outdoors in the Land Rover context. I'm fascinated with this uh, iteration of green. You see brands that are targeting young people, focusing on this really strange, bright, bluish green. Somebody just sent me the catwalk for, was it Louis Vuitton? Or Ferro's, one, one of the big Italian fashion houses, and their entire collection is this color and beige. There's a kind of youth here. There's a kind of energy. There's a kind of way in which this color is not yet shop-worn. It's not yet overburdened with meaning. And it's been very popular. I think, in part, it's because it touches on one of the two great protest colors of our time, hot pink and gilet jaune. Right? This neon green, which was said uh, to be the most visible color to humans by scientists about six or seven years ago. So this most visible color is now one of our top protest colors. It is used, right, gilet jaune is used when people are challenging uh, the prevailing thinking. It's used to perk up urban spaces and make them more interesting. And of course it's used in product. But there's a sense of speed here, right? There's a sense of youth. There's a sense of something interesting that you haven't quite fully defined yet. Super interesting. It's also, as I said, being used as a protest color, right? People are raising their voices by using this color. Green is emerging as a protest color, an anti-abortion uh, limitation protest color, because it's the opposite of red. So this is a protest march in Argentina, which is the birth of the use of green to demand abortion rights, and of course it's making its way to the United States. So this is a really interesting notation, right? Sometimes a color is used because it's the opposite of something that you're protesting. I came across this recently, and I thought it was interesting. This is the aromantic movement flag, delivered in black, gray, and shades of green, obviously being used because red is the color of romance. So if you have no interest in romance, I guess green is your thing. Okay, blue. 
blue is amazing. So think of the virtues of blue. It's open, it's steadfast, it's loyal, it's faithful, it's heartfelt, it's sincere, it's heavenly, and we'll talk about that in a sec. It's a little cool, and that starts to get you towards the negative part about it being cold or even depressive. It, it also is a symbol of nature, of healthy nature. It's rugged, right, through denim, it's accessible, it's sexy, it's mysterious, but as I said, the cold and the melancholy aspect of it is its negative pole. So blue and heavenly. I love these, this picture on the left. This is an alabaster statuette from a temple in a, from ancient Mesopotamia. The eyes of the people who made this were unlikely to have been blue, they were probably brown. They're blue, made of lapis lazuli, because in the temple, this person would have been perceiving the divine. And so in a complete and open state of awe, of course the eyes are filled with the color of the sky, which is where most of the gods live. So this sets up an association with blue and the heavens, blue and the gods, that comes down to us through the Virgin Mary, right? In the middle you see Isis nursing her child, often depicted in blue with lapis lazuli hair, or if not totally blue, and the Virgin Mary. There's a French historian named Michel Pastoureau who wrote some really great books about color, and he traces the status of blue moving from not very important in Western culture to hugely important during the Gothic era. In part, stained glass technology developed amazing blues. In part, um, lapis lazuli pigment was more and more available to artists, though expensive and lapis was used to depict the clothing of the most important people in a painting. So blue starts to acquire all of this importance and this holiness uh, and this authority across that era. You see it today. You know a certain shade of blue is, of course, the Virgin Mary shade. This is a piece of art by Portia Munson, who collects cast-offs and reassembles them into art. And in a brand context, you see this reassuring, honest, stable presence don't you? There's nothing controversial about blue. Blue as a royal color, as a color of politics, comes about in that Gothic era. Uh, on the left here is 1223, that is the coronation of Louis IX, who becomes Saint Louis. In the middle, that is him again. Uh, on the right is his mother, Blanche of Castile, uh, giving him a talking to about something. And it's these two, Blanche and Louis, who really make uh, blue into a noble color, a color of authority, a color of people of status. This gets translated across the channel in 1348 with the Order of the Garter. The French wouldn't be left behind. In 1578, they create the Order of the Holy Spirit, which is the guy in the armor here on the right. So this idea of the blue ribbon, of course, comes down to us unbroken as a symbol of quality through Pap's blue ribbon, which before prohibition used millions of feet of blue silk ribbon a year in its packaging. Let's go to blue denim. So. Denim comes from Denim, Serge Denim, because it was a fabric woven for uh, the working class shepherds in the south of France. And jeans, that comes from Genoa, because there was a fabric woven about a century later for sailors and indigo on indigo. The, uh, the denim fabric, the neem fabric, was uh, one strand white, one strand blue. So this workwear comes to us, you know, we think through uh, Levi's jeans. Mr. Levi did not invent jeans, he did not invent denim, he was just a really good merchant who saw the possibilities. They came to him from a tailor named Jacob Davis who couldn't afford to apply one more time for the patent he was looking for, for the copper rivets that fasten the pockets onto the jeans. So they, uh, Mr. Strauss paid for the patent and owned a 50% interest in the denim and the rest of course is history. This comes down to us as such a powerful symbol as opposed to mere workwear in part because of Hollywood. When the Western became immensely popular, right, this great story, this great fable of the United States civilization, cowboys often wore denim in the movies. In point of fact, they usually wore hand-me-downs. There wasn't that much denim seen on the back of a horse in reality. But it takes off, and it sweeps its way around the world. So blue becomes a color of honest people, honest working people, a certain amount of earthiness and sincerity. It doesn't achieve sex appeal until Marlon Brando in Streetcar Named Desire. There's a story that the costume designer who did uh, the costumes for the Broadway play that he was in pinned him as tight as she could into seven pairs of blue jeans and then shrank them in the wash for a full 24 hours and dried them in a dryer for a full 24 hours. And he really liked them. 
And because he was a method actor, he asked her to cut out the pocket linings because he said the animal that was Stanley Kowalski would love to have put his hands in his pockets and, you know. So this smoldering sexuality is embraced by Hollywood and taken around the world. So jeans move from being something that you wore to work to something that you wore on other occasions. It's taken up, of course, by Marilyn Monroe. And I got a big jolt in the 70s when Brooke Shields was doing Calvin Klein jeans advertisements, right? Do you remember how scandalous that was? Yep. So jeans really took on a whole other identity. These days, you see people wearing indigo in jeans to proclaim other messages. So this is Riz Ahmed, who wore a, um, a blue-collar outfit, as he described it, to the Met Gilded Age Gala to remind people that all the riches that people were sporting were actually paid for with the labor of others. You see Harry Styles asserting the right to be as feminine as he wants to be and as famous as he wants to be. And you see Lizzo wearing a lot of denim and tight-fitting things to really invite you to reconsider all your stereotypes about body image. So denim continues to be something that's accessible to everyone. Blue logos. So we've been through trustworthiness and deity. We've been through sex appeal. We've been through every man appeal. And isn't it interesting that many of the businesses that use blue want us to feel reassured and calm and trusting? And maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> right? I think it's really interesting. At this point, I think the bluer the logo, the more I really want to see some detail. <laughs> and as we, we mentioned earlier, blue is a symbol of environmental health thanks in part to just a handful of photographs from the early NASA launches that were taken from space. All of a sudden, the Earth was no longer a map of countries and political borders. It was one thing, and it had systems flowing through it. It was a living thing. So in many ways, blues, blue is, like green, a color of life. Blue is also most often cited as people's favorite color all around the world. It's really fascinating. Purple. All right, so purple, royalty, luxury, but also mourning, grief, and hurt. Enlightenment, spirituality, insight, eccentricity, rule-breaking, and gayness. Let's talk for a second about purple as a color of spirituality. We think of purple as the color of the top chakra, right? The color of enlightenment. Do you know that is not really a thing? Chakras were not painted in colors in ancient depictions. It was an Englishman named Ledbetter who was a devotee of spirituality, Eastern spirituality, and he's the one who linked Newton's rainbow, which had seven colors, to the chakra system, which had seven colors. So aside from the root chakra of red, conveniently at the beginning of Newton's spectrum, there were no colors until Charles Ledbetter said there were. 1920s, he wrote his first book about the chakras, defining them in color. So let's talk about purple as a political color, as a color of power. You know about Tyrrhenian purple in the Mediterranean, right? Those little mollusks that I mentioned earlier. You had to kill thousands of them to make an ounce of purple dye. So the robe of an emperor dyed completely purple, and deep purple at that, would have just been a massacre for those poor shellfish. And the color was so popular in Persia, in ancient Rome, uh, only the Greeks really disdained it, that the, the shellfish were actually over-harvested and almost extinct. People are now saying that you can once again make shellfish purple in the Mediterranean. It's very interesting. In the middle is a picture of Prince Shotoku, who is a 6th century Japanese figure. He was one of the people who took Buddhism throughout Japan, and he was a reformer. He sought to define 12 statuses in society, and the top three of those were defined with shades of purple. It was a meritocracy. You could achieve purple. You didn't have to be born into it. It's really fascinating and very unique for that time. Japanese purple came from purple gromwell, which is a beautiful little wild flower, and it was the root of the purple gromwell. And like the shellfish in the Mediterranean, it was over-harvested and almost taken out of existence. So there are a few groups in Japan now who are assiduously cultivating purple gromwell to keep it alive as a plant and as a dye stuff. You see George VI and Queen Elizabeth, it's a very small image, but this idea of purple as an imperial color comes unbroken to us. And I bet Charles wears it when he's crowned as well. So this idea of authority, luxury, and richness comes from this idea of imperial and royal identity. 
That's a little bit of um, a piece of cloth in Charlemagne's tomb, believe it or not. And purple is still alive with us in Oaxaca as a shellfish dye, right? This is a prestige color. You see one of the Mishtek women uh, who weave the fabric, the, the fiber that is dyed by their fishermen husbands uh, along the Pacific coast of Oaxaca. It's an endangered color because of the decline of the shellfish population. We're likely to have this only for 10 more years. You see purple used as a color of exotic luxury. It's very decadent. There's a lot of reasons for that. You see people trying to step out of the norm with purple used in their graphic design. And of course you see it pretty regularly in fashion. As a logo color, I think you see it used in companies that are trying to step into an exceptional status, right? Virgin Atlantic, Asprey, okay, Hallmark. I don't quite think they deserve it, but there you are, right? The crown, they're still holding on to that. I love purple as a color of eccentricity. Right? You see Prince here, pretty amazing, his embrace of purple. And it was because it could be perceived as a rule-breaking color, a fugitive, strange, rule-breaking color. Did you know that his favorite color was orange? Purple as a color of gayness, very interesting. Um, you can go way back to Sappho and her descriptions of women wearing violet necklaces and purple anemones in their hair. You can go very quickly to this book and play called The Captive. It was originally a French novel. It was translated into English and turned into a play in the 1920s. It was a hit play with sold out houses for about four months and then somebody with more of, more of a moral majority slant on things protested. It was a story about two women. They decide for the better of both of their families to not be together and their parting gift is two bunches of violets. When the moral majority thing got a hold uh, in the press, Sales of violets plummeted. The authorities felt that they needed to take a move against gayness, and they stamped out things that had been in existence for decades. The early drag balls, which are with us again today, had been in existence for 70, 60, 70, 80 years, and they were all shut down in the 1930s. But this association with purple and gayness endures into the 50s when our wonderful Senator McCarthy, who was responsible for the Red Scare, also created the Lavender Scare where people by the thousands were chased out of employment in the State Department mostly, but other government agencies as well, for a suspicion of being gay. That memory from the 50s reaches into post-Stonewall protest marches and parades, and purple as a gay color was very much in evidence in the 70s. By the time you reach the AIDS crisis, pink takes over, right? We talked about that. And with the passing of the most acute part of the AIDS crisis, the rainbow takes over. So purple, I love the red violet, I love the magenta, I love the craziness of it, and I think you see people embracing that. The eccentricity, the oddness, the rule breaking. And I also think that people like purple because it can use the blue values and the red values almost as a contrast, and yet it's not a contrast, it's a tone on tone uh, gesture and design. And I think people who use purple in their logos are wanting to be different, right? This red violet bit, I think it's fabulous. Okay, last two colors. I'm afraid that I was a little bit superficial with white and black, but we're gonna to try to make up for it. <laughs> so white as a color of purity, virginity, holiness, as a color of principle. It can also be perceived as being aloof and insincere and deceitful, right, as in whitewashing. It can seem exclusive and prejudiced. It can seem empty. It can seem, on the other hand, very hygienic and full of potential. I think we're seeing a wave of interest in white as a post-pandemic color because it still symbolizes cleanliness, right, and health. So I love the white as a color of principle. You see Gandhi wearing his natural whites. You see Princess Leia, go back and watch all the Star Wars movies if you can stand it, always in white. <laughs> She's the unwavering, balanced, right, principled character in the, in the cycle. And this is Mrs. Pankhurst, early protest clothing. The women's movement chose white because they saw it as something that everyone could wear. They chose it because everyone could show up in a bleached garment and be a full participant in the marches. And they also chose not to have a color as their symbol because they felt it might marginalize them and make them seem frivolous. White seemed serious. It worked. So white as a luxury color, of course, something above it all, something untouched by other influences is with us. And this is the hygienic reference, right? This is the most beautiful swimming pool complex on the left in France outside of Paris. 
And this is a picture of a 1930s Italian bathroom. The advent of white toiletries, white toilets, white tiles, didn't come about until after the Spanish flu epidemic, right? There was a sweeping away of Victorian clutter. Wood floors were seen as hard to clean and germy. Fabrics were seen as hard to clean and germy. This notion of gleaming white ceramics uh, comes from that time. Right, it still reaches us as a clean, fresh, pure thing in product. Okay, black, this is the last color. So, nothingness, potential, gestation, death and mourning. Black can be a crisis color. It can be a symbol of the unconscious, sleep, dreams, nightmares. It can be seen as very serious and very disciplined. It gestures at race, it gestures at power, at rebellion. It's something modern too, and it's overwhelming, it's unavoidable. I think black and white are so rich with meaning because they're always the two, the first two bits of color vocabulary to enter every human language around the world. Black and white, dark and light. So the layering of meaning had a lot of time to accumulate. As a color of mourning, black reach, has roots in ancient Rome with a toga pula, which was a, a toga made of dark wool that was worn privately to mourn the loss of a loved one. In Victorian England, of course, it reaches a height of ritual which is overwhelming, right, with these long periods of mourning where women could wear only black. This outfit on the left is a silk crepe outfit, and silk crepe was heat treated with lots of chemicals so that it would be matte finished, stiff, and uncomfortable. It was supposed to reflect the mental state of the wearer. It actually affected the physical state of many wearers because as those chemicals gassed off, it really created a lot of ill health. Sores on the skin, problem with the eyes, the veils particularly were dangerous because they were where you were breathing. Uh, it took a long time for those customs to go away. Interestingly, Queen Victoria was the primary advocate of those customs, but her daughter-in-law, Alexandra, was the one to start to break them. She refused to wear black crepe to mourn her son, who died typhoid, I think, and she refused to wear black to mourn Queen Victoria, too, and things started to loosen. Black worn outside the context of mourning, as with Madame X here, Amélie Goutreau, was a scene of wantonness. Because think about the widow. The widow is a sexually experienced person. Think about the widow with means. She was autonomous and sexually experienced. So black was a bit of a racy color. Fascinating. It makes its way into literature in Anna Karenina. Do you remember Anna decides not to wear a demure lavender gown, but rather a black one to a ball? And this is where she meets Count Vronsky, and then the rest is disaster. <laughs> so. Coco Chanel, the inventor of the little black dress, she takes this strand of mourning. There was plenty of mourning going on, First World War, uh, Spanish flu epidemic, her own loss, right? She lost her great loves, an Englishman named Boy Capel, and then she invents the little black dress. It was a symbol of getting on with it. It was a symbol of independence. It was a symbol of efficiency. It was the Ford motor car of the wardrobe, and it took off, and she had a lot to say about it, too. Um, you see it in every decade. This idea of the essential, powerful, efficient black dress is adapted in every decade. So this is Sophia Loren in the 40s. This is Audrey Hepburn in the 60s. And this is Liz Hurley kind of wearing a dress in the 90s. <laughs> this, the famous Versace safety pin dress. Black is a luxury color in part because of this little black dress phenomenon. So full of authority, so full of certainty, Right, so full of luxurious riches. Let's talk about black as a power color. The, the guy on the left is um, the Duke of Burgundy, Philip the Good, whose father was assassinated by his French rivals in 14 something. And Philip mourned for his father and never took off mourning black. And he's the first person to, have, to be acknowledged uh, living a life in black clothing. It came to symbolize a certain amount of piety and seriousness, hence Philip the Good. Even though he had 18 illegitimate children, he was one of the richest men of his day, filled with all the habits of rich men of those days. In the middle is Charles V, who is his great-grandson. This tradition of black clothing comes down through his granddaughter, Philip the Good's granddaughter, into the Habsburg family into which she married. And black is taken around the world by the Spanish Habsburgs as a symbol of power, right? Into the New World, into Asia, into everywhere as a symbol of serious power. 
Black as a symbol of taste really comes to us from Baldassare Castiglione, who wrote The Courtier. And he explored black as the appropriate choice for men of education and distinction, because it represented a cool, dispassionate, polite way of engaging with the world. It was not over the top, like German and French fashion. It was serious and dignified. Black is a uniform color for many, obviously, right? It is power. It is seriousness. It does indicate a certain commitment. So you see mm, the uniforms of Mussolini's black shirts on the left, whose seriousness came to end, which was fabulous. You see black as the uniform color of the black power movement, right? Who reappropriated the idea of what it was to be black and often wore this sort of paramilitary feeling uniform to express their desire for a fundamental change in status on a global level, right? Their ambitions were not limited to the United States. You see S&M rebels from the 70s and you see the punks of the 80s. This black uniform works really well to declare an exceptional status for yourself. Doesn't it? <laughs> I put Darth Vader there because I think that this unbroken line of black as a symbol of ultimate power really needs to be thought about. Because you often see it used to convince us of things. Right? This is a couple of iPhones ago, and the, the, the resemblance of Darth Vader to this ad campaign really struck me. Here is a company wanting you to believe that they are producing the ultimate, most unassailable product offering that can be presented. Is it true? Maybe, maybe not. But I think it's the message that we need to be skeptical about. Okay, that we've run through the spectrum, plus three colors. Congratulations on your patience. I, I hope that somehow this presentation does talk about the positive pole and the negative pole of each color. And it does talk to some degree about the persuasive potential that each color has and is often used to achieve. This book, Deep Color, that we're here to launch tonight, which is so great, came out of a series of media literacy workshops that I was asked to participate in at my daughter's high school, where the kids are being asked to step back Look at the words that are being used. Look at the sources being cited. Look at the argument being made. Look at the media organization who's framing all of this up and make their own independent decision about what to think and what to believe and how to behave. Color is a part of that persuasive mechanism. And we often really don't think much about it. So I think the more aware we are, the more sober and wise we can be uh, about the decisions that we make based on that compelling drive to purchase that color is so important with. All right. Thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate it.